Okay, so now on to the second topic, and this is another common source of questions for the MOC, uh, as well as the in-training. Uh, this uh, deals with stability techniques, and this is question number four. And when using large femoral heads and total hip, uh, the stability or benefit of a larger head is lost with what technical error? And if you look at your options, um, vertical cup placement is what uh, kind of eliminates the benefit of a large femoral head. Uh, and that was pretty clearly understood by the participants, so I think that's a fairly basic point there. If you look at uh, stability in general, there are four main variables that control or to help determine the stability of a total hip. One has to do with component design, and we'll go over some uh, aspects of that. Uh, the positioning of the components, as we just mentioned in that last question. Uh, the tensioning of the soft tissues. I think of the soft tissues acting like rubber bands, and if your rubber bands are not tense, the hip will dislocate. And soft tissue function. So again, if your rubber bands aren't functioning well, either due to a neuro neurologic situation or absence of abductors, that can lead to instability. So we'll go over each one of those aspects of hip stability. So first, large femoral heads. The concept here is to make sure you understand head-neck ratio. So the larger the head-neck ratio, the better stability you have. And head-neck ratio is influenced by head size and neck diameter. So decreased dislocation rates if you have a better head-neck ratio. And again, if you have a larger head as depicted in figure B, relative to a given neck size, that improves your ratio and it allows more range of motion before the neck impinges on the component. So that's the primary uh, effect of a bad head-neck head ratio leads to earlier impingement and the head can lever out of the socket. Head-neck ratios can be influenced by head size, but also by trunnion size or the use of a skirt. So when you add a skirt to uh, achieve a longer neck length or longer head length, that skirt uh, uh, effectively fattens your trunnion and leads to earlier impingement. So it decreases your head-neck ratio. <coughs> Another uh, concept with the larger heads uh, is the jump distance. So dislocation rates are reduced with larger heads for two reasons. One is the impingement we just talked about with the head-neck ratio, but also it takes more uh, distance to have the head jump out of the socket uh, or more translation laterally to have the head uh, dislocate. Um, somewhere here, so it, under importance it says the large femoral heads are seated deeper within the acetabulum. So that's not entirely uh, true. The center of rotation is at the same location, whether you have a small head or a large head. The uh, edge of the, of the uh, large head is deeper in the acetabulum, but the center of rotation remains the same. But because the edge of a larger head is deeper, it takes more translation for it to uh, jump. So that's a concept that is frequently asked as well. So on the acetabular side, there are a couple of things you can do in regards to the design to improve your stability. First is an elevated rim liner depicted in uh, D. And you can see that if you have an elevated rim liner and the component impinges or translates, it has to go farther before it dislocates. So in registries, uh, particularly the um, uh, English registry, the UK registry, the elevated lip liners, lip liners had lower dislocation rates. Uh, I'm not sure if there'd be a question about it, but there is a difference between an elevated rim liner and a face-changing liner. So an elevated rim liner adds material to one side of the polyethylene, and it does decrease the range of motion of the femoral neck before impingement. Instead of being 180 degrees, it's now somewhat less than 180 based on how much material you add. With a face-changing liner, it basically changes the opening of the cup, so it maintains a 180 degree opening, but it may be canted 10 degrees or 15 degrees, and so it can be used to uh, help improve uh, position of a component, but it doesn't have additional material added uh, to make it more stable. So elevated rim liner and face changing liners have some differences. Uh, they can help with stability. And then the other uh, option on the acetabular side is a lateralized liner. And you can see in figure uh, A and D on the right 
that the lateralized liner moves the center of rotation out further. So it's still a 180 degree opening. The head is not deeper within the shell. It's still um, at the equator, but it's um, tensions soft tissue around the hip. It's, it's like increasing offset on the femoral side. It uh, moves the head further away from the acetabulum, tensions soft tissue more. It also may help prevent uh, bony impingement around the hip. It gets the trochanter further away from the pelvis, and so there may be more range of motion without the uh, trochanter abutting the pelvis. And then on the acetabular side, uh, positioning is also uh, quite critical in terms of stability. So there are some uh, safe zones, uh, and there's been a lot of controversy and debate in different studies about uh, whether the safe zones are actually the uh, preferred place to be. But in general, uh, antiversion should be 5 to 25 degrees, abduction about 30 to 50 degrees. I would say most people would like to have it uh, 45 degrees be about the highest they would get. Increased abduction leads to increased wear of the polyethylene, ceramic, or metal, whatever bearing you have. If it's uh, in a vertical position, you'd get, generally get increased wear. So a couple of caveats. Uh, questions may refer to anterior or posterior approaches in the position of the acetabular component. If you use a posterior approach, it would make sense that you'd want to have a little bit more antiversion to protect the weakened posterior area. If you use the anterior approach, it would also make sense that you'd want to have a little less antiversion to protect against the weakened anterior area. And dislocation rates in uh, more recent studies are fairly comparable between uh, the two approaches. Um, also, a uh, point in the bottom, if you have hypertrophy of your anterior inferior iliac spine or any bony prominence on the pelvis, you need to watch for bone on bone impingement. Usually when you get above 135 degrees of range of motion, uh, rather than component impingement, you will have bone on bone impingement. That can be affected not just by uh, bony protuberances on the pelvis, but also the amount of antiversion on your femur. If you have a lot of antiversion on your femur, it keeps the trochanter away from the front of your pelvis. If, uh, if you have a press fit stem that cannot be antiverted because of the, the shape of the femur, you may be more likely to have uh, anterior impingement of your trochanter against the pelvis. Uh, let's see, so complications with acetabular position, uh, retroversion is shown on this top radiograph, and they may show a uh, cross table lateral like this. You can see the ischium on the bottom, and clearly the acetabular component is retroverted relative to the ischium. It's, it's uh, way off in that picture. So you want to make sure you understand the, uh, what you're looking at when you're looking at a cross table lateral and the position of the acetabular component. And that can lead to a posterior dislocation, excessive antiversion, anti anterior dislocation, and if you have a vertical cup, uh, as we mentioned, it's easier for the hip to dislocate superiorly, uh, small ball or large ball. Also, uh, late dislocations are not uh, uncommon and are generally related to eccentric polywear, uh, which can lead to some late instability. Uh, excessive uh, adduction or a flat acetabular component um, can lead to some impingement and flexion. I've never seen an inferior dislocation, so I don't think uh, I'd worry too much about that. But if it's too flat, it can lead to some impingement along the rim of the cup. So here's a question regarding stability. Question number 22, 83-year-old, uh, total hip 13 years ago, uh, worsening pain. Um, He, he has some increasing pain in the hip, and if he continues to ambulate on this implant, he is at greatest risk for which of the following? And if you look at your options, there's nothing in there that would suggest infection. Don't see any lysis. If you do look at the radiograph, you see some eccentric polywear, so you might be worried about osteolysis, but I don't really see any on the x-ray. Uh, so acetabular or femoral loosening really would not be a risk. Uh, Number five, periprosthetic fracture. Again, if you saw a lot of osteolysis, you might be concerned about a trochanteric fracture. Uh, so dislocation is the uh, primary answer for this particular situation. But uh, be alert to uh, eccentric polywear. Uh, one of the most common presentations of polywear, or uh, painful presentations, is a pathologic fracture of a trochanter through an osteolytic lesion. So. Um, don't jump to dislocation if you see an x-ray like this. Make sure you look around and see if there's some lysis on the x-ray as uh, some of these other uh, options are potential answers. But in this, in this uh, particular question, dislocation was the correct answer. 
Okay, and then on the femoral side, the ideal femoral position is 10 degrees, 10 to 15 degrees of anaversion. Uh, one concept is to, uh, if you, uh, <coughs> if you look at uh, the amount of anaversion, you'd like to have the femoral head actually in front of the trochanter, and that uh, limits the ability of the trochanter to abut the pelvis. In some situations, it's hard to get the appropriate anaversion. If you're using a press fit um, metaphyseal filling stem, and the patient had a history of skiffy, oftentimes they will remodel into retroversion or neutral version, and it's very difficult to broach that implant into the appropriate amount of anaversion. Not sure if that would come up on questioning. So uh, another concept is the concept of combined version. So uh, this may mean if you're not able to get complete uh, antiversion on the femur, you might add a little extra antiversion on the acetabular component, but the combined antiversion should be somewhere between 35 and 40 degrees. Okay, so here's a uh, good question. Uh, question number one, often asked, I think this uh, uh, requires a couple of answers to get to the correct uh, response. So the picture on the right depicts a Trendelberg sign, a full leg stance on the left leg and a drooping pelvis to the right, uh, which is indicative of weak abductors. So then the question, so you need to understand what they're showing in the picture, then the question asks, what would exacerbate this abnormal finding? Um, so the question would be, what would exacerbate weak abductors? And if you look through the uh, options, um, going backwards, uh, moving the acetabular cup inferiorly, really no relation to that, increasing femoral neck length, uh, no relation, femoral head size, no relation, uh, changing from standard offset to extended offset. So increasing offset would generally improve your abductor strength or improve your um, biomechanical advantage of your abductors. So that would actually increase your strength. So the answer would be decreasing femoral offset would exacerbate your already weak abductors. So the answer to this would be number one. And it looks like most everybody got that right. So um, just a depiction of femoral offset. Uh, it's a line drawn through the center of the medullary canal to the center of the head. Uh, increasing offset moves your trochanter further away from the pelvis. It improves the function of your abductors, uh, decreases your joint reactive force for that very reason. So just biomechanically, two things that decrease your joint reactive force, if you medialize the center of rotation of your acetabulum and you lateralize your trochanter or your abductor moment, both of those will decrease your joint reactive force. Uh, so um, increased offset leads to increased soft tissue tension, sometimes to a fault. If you increase your offset too much, you may create uh, somewhat of an abduction contracture and an apparent leg length discrepancy. Uh, it does decrease the joint reactive force. Decreasing offset may lead to instability, uh, primarily due to lax soft tissue, but also due to abductor weakness and may create a little bit of a uh, gluteus medius lurch or a Trendelenburg sign by weak abductors. There are a number of ways you can increase your offset. We've talked about some of these already. Uh, one is to increase the length of your femoral neck. Now most femoral necks come off at 45 degrees, so if you increase your neck length, you're not just increasing offset, you're increasing leg length. So if you want to affect offset only by increasing your femoral neck length, you also need to seat the stem a little bit deeper. Another option is uh, decreasing your neck shaft angle, which uh, some stems will have a high offset option with a more varus femoral neck. Uh, some stems just medialize the femoral neck, keep the same 45 degree angle, but they medialize the starting point, so that increases your offset. Not done very often now, but trochanteric advancements used to be a way to increase offset or move your abductor moment further lateral. Um, and then use a uh, lateralized acetabular liner that we talked about earlier. So if you use a plus four, uh, plus six liner, it moves your center rotation further out, increases your offset. Uh, if you keep everything else the same on the thermal side. So offset is a common theme in these questions. Okay, uh, three main, well, another factor that uh, can affect soft tissue function and hip stability is uh, neurologic issues. 
So um, if you can have weak abductors for a number of reasons. One is if uh, you have minimal offset. Two is if you have uh, loss of abductors, a bald trochanter, either from injury or from metallosis, which is not mentioned here, but I think metallosis is a common cause for loss of abductors. And then another is uh, that's commonly used in questions is this uh, neurologic situation. So patients uh, who are described in a question with either a prior stroke or Parkinson's or dementia or MS, myelopathy, anything that uh, alarm should go off when you hear a neurologic disorder, that they're looking for a, somebody who's at high risk for dislocation. So you want to do anything that would trigger um, a more stable hip, a larger head size, a constrained liner, um, MDM, I don't know if that will be on a, a test or not, um, but anything that might improve the stability of a hip. So the neurologic disorder can also be peripheral too. It can be due to uh, spinal stenosis. Good to remember that the gluteus medius innervation through the superior gluteal nerve comes through L5. So severe lower lumbar degenerative changes can lead to some uh, gluteus weakness, uh, Trendelenburg gait, and potential instability. Um, so anyway, that's a good point. Any neurologic uh, condition should trigger the thoughts of hip instability. And then uh, just loss of soft tissue integrity. I mentioned that with uh, metallosis can do it, irradiation, infection, trauma, anything that can do damage to the abductors, multiple revisions. So just be thinking, uh, you, sometimes you're trying to guess what they're thinking in the question, and anything that might decrease abductor strength can lead to instability. So this uh, question uh, points to the bone-on-bone um, -bone impingement I was talking about earlier. So if you have a uh, design cup and hip with a good head-neck ratio that allows for a lot of range of motion, once you get above about 135 degrees, the trochanter abut can abut against the pelvis. So ways to improve that would be to move the trochanter further away from the pelvis. And that can be by lateralizing the acetabular cup uh, actually, this question states, um, during the time of surgery, what is the most likely factor leading to this bone-on-bone -bone impingement? So the way you would improve it would be lateralizing the cup. Number two, decreasing femoral offset would actually worsen it. Increasing femoral offset would, again, move the trochanter further away, would improve it. Increasing acetabular inclination would have no effect. Small head nectar ratio would have no effect. So decreasing femoral offset would worsen or cause this kind of bone-on-bone -bone impingement at the time of surgery. So two would be the correct answer. And uh, that seemed to be a pretty easy one for everybody. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.